warm welcome for the three, please. So good morning. Morning. Good morning. I run an EA team. Our EA team does essentially two things. We deliver EA enterprise architecture work for our customers. Second thing we do is develop teams. And what we're going to do today is talk mostly about developing a team of architects. And teams and architects go together. Development and architects go together. And generational and succession planning go together. How do you get the team you need to move forward? And I'm going to start one thing by talking about enterprise architecture, because there's a recurrent challenge I run into, is people don't assume enterprise architecture is a role. They don't assume it's a job. They don't assume it's a career. They assume it's a measure of seniority. I don't assume it's a measure of seniority. If you read one of the Open Group publications, The Governor's Guide, it's got a section in it where it talks about roles in governing enterprise architecture. And it makes a very strong distinction between a subject matter expert and an architect. A subject matter expert is somebody who knows a great deal about a subject, who knows something, and is able to move forward and describe that in detail. We often assume subject matter experts are required to do architecture. That's where we get into the trap and the fallacy of seniority. Enterprise architects, architects have a different job. Knowing what our stakeholders are want in the future, balancing a set of competing priorities, and balancing competing input from competing subject matter experts. It's an important element. We'll go to the next one, Romy. So new architects. I want you to imagine something as we're going through this. Imagine you had a best practice team. Imagine you were able to seamlessly lever in together architects, subject matter experts, and stakeholders to develop what is required. Now, we're going to go through this, and I'm going to challenge you because we're going to use millennials as an example. Because millennials are new. They're with us. In fact, I read the other day they now make up 50% of the workforce here in North America. How many of us think that brand new hires are appropriate to being architects? Anybody who's in the room, think about your very first job. Think about all the teams that you've been involved in. It's very common for us when we're setting up a team at a client to have a group of people with no prior architecture experience. But they have other experience. And that's OK. Now, We'll go on to the next one, Romy, please. We're going to talk today about developing that team and developing a new architect. And how do you manage this? And we're going to walk our way through four steps. How do you go and acquire talent? How do you go to that great talent market in the sky and get great architects? How do you develop them? How do you assess their development, and when you've got a high-functioning team, how do you structure an architecture project to take advantage of it? So we're going to do a couple of things that are different. I've got a handout for you to help you along, in case you want to follow along. It's on your table. Second thing is we're going to make a transformation, literally from black and white to color. Romy, could you roll the first clip, please? Hello, Millennial. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Did you uh, bring a copy of your resume? Oh, I did. It's right here. Well, let's see. You do 
know that this is an interview for an enterprise architect position? Yes, I do. I see. So how many years experience do you have as an enterprise architect? None. Have you been on any architecture projects? No. Nope. Do you have any architecture certifications? I do not. Oh, I see. Do you have any experience with any architecture tools? No. Well, what experience do you have? Well... Well, thanks for coming in, Miss Millennial. Thank Pleasure you. to meet you, and we will let you know. Thank you. Will someone get me HR? I wonder who is screening these resumes. Now that's one way to recruit. <laughs> what are you going to get with that recruition? You're going to get people who are subject matter experts. Are you going to build a generational team through that? We'll go on to the next one. It's a serious question. How do you hire a new architect? How do you hire somebody who's got what it takes to deliver best-in-class architecture? What are you looking for? Their prior experience doing work? Their prior experience implementing IT systems? their prior experience running a marketing department. So, we're going to talk about a different way to hire. Morning. I'd like to start off by talking about my actual experience with my interview with Dave to be a part of his architecture team. And it was one of the weirdest experiences of my life. <laughs> um, he didn't ask me a single question about what I learned at college. He didn't ask me about any prior job experience. Uh, it didn't seem to matter what my experience was. I wasn't even sure he had read my resume. It didn't seem to matter. Uh, we talked about how I interacted with other, others. Uh, we talked about my commitment to fencing at school. Uh, what was even more interesting to me was the very first question he asked me was, do I like Italian food after already arriving to the Italian restaurant? So in retrospect, if you're hiring a millennial, if you're hiring a new architect, what are you looking for? I'm shopping for two things, attitude and aptitude. I assume they don't know how to architect. I assume we're going to have to teach that. Attitude and aptitude become absolutely critical. Anyone ever tried to explain enterprise architecture as a profession to their mother? <laughs> My mom doesn't know what I do for a living. She says I do stuff. <laughs> so now, explain that on your job posting. Explain that to the person coming in on the hire for the interview. Or are you going to look for aptitude? Are you going to look for attitude? Are you going to look for their ability to effectively communicate? Are you going to look for their ability to work on a team? Are you going to look at their ability to think, to lead, and communicate? So Sam, in retrospect, how did that interview play out? What was I hunting? Well, at first, it seemed like you just wanted to talk to me about my interests and things I was into. But in retrospect, you asking me about my interests and my commitments, like participating in team sports, I could tell you were looking for my ability to collaborate with others effectively. Specifically, your question around how I um, handle disagreements with my peers? How did they get resolved? Did I defend my ideas? Did I listen to reason? Was I able to blend my knowledge? Hear other points of views? This is critical for dealing with subject matter experts and balancing stakeholder preferences. 
If we were going to disagree, Dave and I, was it going to be a waste of time? Or was it going to be producing more better results? I think you were testing for my nimble thinking and being able to accept the fire hose pressure of transferable knowledge you're going to give to me in a short period of time. Oh, and it turns out liking Italian food was going to be a deal breaker. <laughs> uh, as consultants, we eat, we eat out often. Fortunately, I love Italian food, so I got the job. Uh, unfortunately, a few weeks later, we went to a steakhouse and I ordered vegetables, so I got fired again. So in the interview, I heard the interviewer asking about technical skills. I have technical skills. I can repair helicopters, I can repair jet turbine engines, or I can non-destructively examine welds for quality and, and safety. When they mentioned technical skills, were those ones that hopped to mind? Or did you go to information data management? Would you have hired me? Now, for transferable skills, Dave and Sam mentioned them. The three that popped to my mind are attention to detail, accountability, and analytics. <coughs> for attention to detail, you can't repair a plane, leave out a bolt, and expect it to work properly. Would you fly in a plane that you knew was missing a bolt? For accountability, aircraft maintenance also has the highest standard in that field. You make a, you make a repair, you write down your name, your number, next to your repair. If anything goes wrong, accident investigators track you down and see if you're still fit to be in the industry, if it was your fault. Have you ever taken your capability, num your capability model, signed your name to it, and seen if you're still fit to be employed in the industry, following a review? That is accountability. For analytics, I find keyword matching is usually a problem. You go to analytics, you immediately go to data analytics, information analytics. Why don't you change that to troubleshooting? Why don't you take that a step further and you go to problem solving? That's what you're looking for. Pilots and VP of sales will say two different things. Pilots will say the plane felt funny, it didn't fly right. VP of sales, they say, we need digital transformation. Or we need to improve the customer experience. That's all well and good if you know how, what you're doing to fix it. But since those don't have a specific answer, you step into troubleshooting. You dig, you explore, you examine, you test all your theories. But you always have to maintain, will the plane still fly when I'm done with it? And is my competitive advantage still available? Maybe the interviewer should have asked for demonstrations of relative skill, of relatable techniques and skill, rather than experience. That's or they could have asked about Italian food. What are you looking for? Think about your hires. That's the challenge. Are you hiring the right people? Are you hiring the people who will excel in their industry? Are you hiring attitude? Are you hiring aptitude? Are you chasing thinking skills? The ability to challenge an idea? The ability to explore an idea? Are you chasing down things that are very, very hard to see in a resume? Particularly when that resume is coming from a new hire, a new graduate. What are you going to see on that resume? You're not going to see, as our film clip showed, a raft of projects, a raft of experience. And if you're chasing keyword matching, you're not going to find it. You're going to have to listen. You're going to have to have a conversation. It's going to be absolutely critical for you to walk your way through that interview in a conversation so that you can hear and explore the fitness of the candidate in terms that will matter over the next period of time. Because if they're a new hire, they don't know how to do architecture. You're going to have to introduce them to the profession. And introducing them to the profession and sustaining them through time requires us to consistently develop, to consistently move ourselves forward. At the end, 
I'm looking for great architecture. I'm looking for great architecture that addresses the needs of my stakeholders, that gets the organization where it wants to be. And I'm going to use the talent that I've got to get there. And critically, I don't want any bolts on the floor. Why don't we get benefits from what we're doing? I know exactly why we don't get benefits from what we're doing. Bolts on the floor. We skip things. We forget what's going on. We carry baggage into the room and we argue with our stakeholders about what they want. That's not what you get with somebody who can collaborate. That's not what you get with somebody who's a creative thinker. That's not what you get with somebody who has the right attitude and aptitude to be an architect. So let's think about how we train and develop. Romy, can you roll the next clip? Well, Millennial, I'm off to the client site to make a presentation to the CEO. I'd love to join you at that meeting. Do you mind if I come listen in? Not this time. Uh, I don't think you're quite ready yet for senior management meetings. However, you could make sure that you get those flowers ordered for my mom. So is that the IT for IT reference architecture you're reading there on your screen? Yes, it is. It's a uh, perfect reference model for the work you're doing at the client site. I was wondering if... Well, no. We don't use reference architectures here. We prefer to do architecture in our heads. So training, training or development, training or development, building an architecture team. We're going to send them to a TOGAF certification course and they're good to go. Don't get me wrong, TOGAF is important, TOGAF is valuable, it's a fundamental of how we've built our practice. But teaching you about the enterprise continuum, understanding it as a concept, doesn't make an architect any more than an, arch than an electrician is developed by knowing the building code. What is it that you need to do? Build an apprenticeship model. Let's step back in time. How do we develop people? Build apprentices. Start them out work through the skills, the technique, the experience, and the judgment. When we're doing our development, we're constantly hunting technique, experience, judgment. What I'm looking for is do I have the ability to do the work? Do I have the knowledge to use the process, the skills, the reference models? Now can I accelerate experience? I don't have time to wait 25 years for 25 years of experience. I need to accelerate it. And I need to create conditions of great judgment. How do I help make my new architects move forward? And importantly, through that process, how do I make sure that my experienced architects are also improved? Where are we going? What is it that we're doing? Now that apprenticeship, all good apprenticeship, is hands-on. Hands-on is right. My second week on the job, and I'm flying out to the head office of a client. I was there surprised to find myself participating already in a scoring workshop for process improvement. It wasn't for a little while till I found out that this process model we were using was a reference model that we'd be using again and again over the years. An industry standard that was simplified. That I could help instruct and explain the model to the leadership with. I even helped walk the leadership through pieces of the workshop. This turned out to be my apprenticeship model. Being in the room for every meeting. Doing something in the room. Showing value. Every meeting the seniors had that they were at, I was right there with them. Another way to gather experience quickly is to always show your work. Strong architects like Dave will hear a question and they can jump to an answer most of the time. 
The problem with this is it occasionally leads to just lip service to both traceability and to your stakeholders. Walking through every step ensures you actually deliver. Do you want to jump from A to D or A to Q? Walk through the steps. Confirm your intermediary steps that it actually makes sense. A, B, C, D. During an engagement in Saudi Arabia, I was with the senior architects, Dave and some others, working through a capability model. They were leaping through the steps. I couldn't keep up. So the next day, I, had, I walked them back through the reference model that we were applying to that capability. Can you guess what we found? We found bolts all over the floor. They had missed parts. By leveraging the reference model and our technique, we were able to clean that up, find the right answers, and end up with better architecture for the client. We were able to document trade-off, document traceability to the stakeholder, and better yet, document the difference in the trade-off decisions. We ended up with better architecture for the client. We ended up with nothing missing. No bolts on the floor. So tracing your logic, deliberately developing. What skills? That technique, that experience, that judgment. What are you doing? Are your new architects, your millennials, your people with experience who are new into the field, being brought in in a systematic way? Are they being apprenticed to the trade? Is enterprise architecture for you a career or a badge of seniority? And I'm really focusing on that badge of seniority because it's a recurrent challenge we run into. Oh no, Sam can't do that work because what's the net of the reason? She's too young. So you're building a team. You're walking your way through about deliberately developing somebody, developing the technique, accelerating experience, and creating conditions for judgment. Nathan explained about working with senior architects in terms of technique. Developing in terms of technique is absolutely critical. How many of us? come into the industry, come into with our, carry our baggage into the room, and know how to do things. One of the fundamentals of building a team is that you have a common sport. Let's put a rugby player, a polo player, a soccer player, and a North American football player. They're all running sports. Let's put them on the, on the field together and have them run around. Does anyone know their role? Does anyone know their position? Can they work together seamlessly? How does your architecture team work? Do you follow a common technique? We make aggressive use of reference models. And we make aggressive use of reference models because they do two things. They accelerate our work. Acceleration of the delivery of enterprise architecture is critical. What's a recurrent challenge that you hear? Oh, we can't get the architects involved. It slows everything down. Takes too long to do the architecture. Then we don't get there. Why does it take too long? We reinvent the wheel. And every time you reinvent the wheel, if you do a good job, it's round and removable. I'd like you to reflect for a second on round and removable. How many times have you heard somebody use the phrase, reinvent the wheel, it's always round? What did they leave out? You're right, it's removable. It's far more cost effective, it's cheaper, spot weld the tire on. When you use a reference architecture, when you use good reference models, you have end-to-end -end coverage. You don't have to invent and reflect and cover everything. You don't have to remember it. I use reference models so that I can accelerate the development of my young architects, my new architects. What are the pieces that are included? Nathan had IT for IT up on the clip. What's IT for IT? It's an end-to-end -end information model for IT operations 
got some functional components, but they're way less interesting than the black circles. So if you're ever using IT for IT, black circles. What is the complete set of information that must flow for a high-functioning IT team? Do you have to now reinvent that wheel? Do you now have to remember that wheels are removable? Or do you have it there and are you looking for it so that when you're looking for the proposal component, well, the reference model says it exists. The reference model says it's being used. So what's your challenge as an architect? Find it. Where is your portfolio? The company's got one. Where is it? Oh, that's right. It's a collection of sticky notes. It's a collection of whiteboards. It's a collection of project plans and 300 reports from SAP. That's what that information object represents. So I can take my young architects and structure an engagement where they start walking through the model. Where are these pieces? What are the information flows, as Nathan said? They can guide subject matter experts to get a better answer. They can pull information to get better architecture. And they don't show up with prejudged questions. How many times have you been frustrated to work with an enterprise architect who was carrying baggage from their previous work? They knew the answer, and they were going to force fit the answer. Or are you going to listen to your stakeholders? Are you going to guide your stakeholders to trade off? Apprenticeship plays both ways. It's good for me because I have to actually explain my work and I start to find the bolts I'm leaving on the floor. It's good for my staff because we develop consistent work and are able to move ourselves forward. We're able to develop better work as a team. This is important. We're a small group. Our architecture practice is sub-50 people and we work around the globe. We work in multiple time zones. Currently, I've got a team working in Saudi Arabia being supported by a young guy who lives in the Pacific time zone. That's 12 hours apart. Let's do random work. Can you lever people in and out of the work? So let's think about how you assess development. How do you build out that team and how do you know which team members can participate in what? What's the assessment techniques? Can you roll the clip, Romy? Been here six months now. Yes, how time flies. And I think we've been wearing the same clothes when we first met. Yes, I never change. So I've seen. How many billable hours you got in the last six months? Well, none. How many client deliverables have you completed? Zero, of course. So all you've really done in the last six months then is keep me busy. Yes. Well, I've learned so much. What a waste of my time. That performance review spoke to me on a personal level because I thought at my first performance review that I was going to be fired after three months. The list of what I didn't know just kept getting longer and longer. I had lost track of everything I had learned. But when you think back to development, aptitude, and attitude, my story changes. I've always been part of best practice. I've always done formal modeling. I've always done component and relationship traceability. That's just second nature. You take an application, you break it apart into functional pieces, model the information flows, and take both those pieces and information flows and bring them back to the business. You find your target for the stakeholders, how it all lines up. That's just second nature. It's what I do. It's what I've always done. I didn't realize the habit. I could only see senior architects leaping from here's your question to here's my answer. Just done. And I couldn't do that. So, But now, in a, late, in a recent engagement with Samantha, we did a roadmap across six state agencies with independent missions, and they were all sharing information. We were able to break all that work across our team 
and bring it back together seamlessly. No hiccups. Our approach and using a formal modeling tool allowed that. This is an example of each individual architect walking away from the others, just the information architect ignoring the application architect, ignoring the security architect, and then bringing the work back and saying, why doesn't it work? This is a team of architects breaking the work apart, taking responsibility for their part of the architecture, and bringing it back. It just fits. Sam and I can use our senior resources for point questions and for overall quality review. It's fantastic. But without a consistent method, a consistent repository, and a consistent team, this isn't possible. Team development is best accomplished by playing to your team member's strengths. Play to your team member's strengths. The apprenticeship model and my team staged my development. For example, leading an architecture approach is not easy. My first time leading, I had two leader senior resources at handy. It was a good thing too, because I needed a lot of coaching. But my team had my back. The next time, I didn't need nearly as much coaching. That next time, I led an initiative which client, with client resources and some senior oversight. Don't misunderstand. This is not the typical Jedi relationship, the Padawan learning from the master. A team develops different strengths and different skills at different rates and different times. Everyone teaches and everyone learns. I was able to teach my client resource technique to how to build an information model. At the same time, he provided me the knowledge and the insights to guide and shape the information architecture. The same one for Nathan. He taught formal modeling, at the same time learning application architecture from Shrey, one of our other lead senior resources. The apprenticeship model is all about setting up your team so that they don't fail. I had the seniors nearby, should I need them for help? I had a safe space to learn and try new things. I never got set up for a performance review like the one in the video. I get to walk into my performance review with several examples of how I demonstrated value. I am, however, expected to be self-aware and learn and know the link between what I've learned, what I've done, and the value that I deliver to my team. So when you're staging development, it works with deliberate support. Sam told us a story about leading an initiative. We very clearly identify the people who need to do the work. And we have somebody who owns the initiative and moves it forward and leads it. Does it mean that they do all the work because it's a team? Does the quarterback do everything? Does the goalie do everything? Or do they play as a coordinated whole? And how do you develop that experience? So the very first time we had Sam lead an initiative, she had two resources on it, myself and Sriram. It was safe. She could crash and burn, and that was OK. She learned from that initiative, was able to expand onto a future initiative, and most recently, ran the show on an initiative where she was also a key delivery resource. Consistent development. How do I accelerate experience? Acceleration of experience. At the team, at the practice, I talk a great deal about acceleration, about why we use reference models, about why we use formal modeling tools, about why we use an apprenticeship approach. And it's about acceleration accelerating time to value, accelerating time to experience, and providing and consistently delivering better work. Leveraging the right resources. When I've got a team, I can look at how my structure is. I can look at who is required to do the work. What are the different resources? And in that development of the team, the essential piece is what are they able to do that they couldn't do before? 
As architects, we talk a great deal about capability-based planning and capabilities, and capabilities are miracle and magical. If you're developing an EA team and you don't have a capability roadmap, how credible are you to talk about somebody else's capability development? Or do you have a bolt on the floor? What's the ability development of your team? Are you able to deliver the architecture that's required? Think about TOGAF, jump into phase A. What's the one of the very first steps in phase A? It says it's a capability assessment. What do most people immediately run to? Oh, I'm gonna assess the capabilities of the business. Have you ever read the text? It says assess the capability of the architecture team. Can they deliver this piece of work? Are you able to move forward? Are you able? And if you're not developing your team, if you don't have a consistent approach, it's much harder. So think about a real performance review. What work did I do or my abilities? What's the development that I've got? Focusing on growth, collaboration. You guys ever work with a superhero architect? Superman, knows everything, does everything, only her way? Or are you trying to build an architecture that spans multiple disciplines and multiple things? Because if you've worked with the superheroes, what collaboration do you have? Are you able to move forward? to seamlessly bring people in? And is the learning being applied? Is that experience accelerating? Are we able to do better? And a key piece of that when you're looking for teamwork and collaboration is the ability to learn and intake and capture information from others. Why? The world is filled with subject matter experts. Subject matter experts who know a great deal about a narrow thing. And they will view the entire world from the perspective of their narrow thing. So you ever talk to a user experience person? Have they able to talk about anything other than user experience or customer experience? Or now let's talk about the accounting department. One of our uh, clients was looking at doing some work on a digital transformation and one of the requirements that came in from accounting was clean order entry for a services company. Delivering that was going to break the customer experience. Who knows all that? I'm gonna have to bring in a subject matter expert, listen to them, listen to their concerns, listen to their awareness, their expertise, and as an architect, put together a whole that delivers. So if you have multiple engagement models with your customer, is following the accounting advice of a single order entry process appropriate, or is it inappropriate? Focus on growth of your team. And when you have a team, and I wish you all that you guys could have what I've got. I have an awesome team scattered around the globe. We work together consistently, consistent approach. And when you have a team, you're in a position to put the project in place and put the right people on the project to deliver what's required. Can you roll a clip about team planning, Romy? Great news, everyone. We just won a $2 million enterprise architecture contract. HR manager, I take it you've heard about our new enterprise architecture contract we just won. Well, I'm going to need three senior enterprise architects by Friday. But...
We build EA teams for a living. We build, we deliver best-in-class architecture for a living. It makes sense to make most of this stuff repeatable. Not some of it, most of it. Predictable EA. Plan your work to deliver EA. Deliver the architecture consistently and deliver the architecture within a fixed period of time and deliver it predictably. The result of best practice team planning, ruthless repeatability, consistency across your work. In my recent experience, I led an effort with Nathan and another new architect with the oversight of senior leaders, providing review and support. How many times have your team done similar deliverables, but it feels like you start over from scratch each time? Maybe you had new clients, maybe you had new team members or old team members leave. Start with what you need. This is what we've learned. Break it down to the pieces that will, when finished, finalize your deliverable. Divide the work up across your team and leverage reference models ruthlessly every chance you have. Otherwise, you're simply recreating the wheel, as Dave says. The wheel is round and removable every single time. There's no value in recreating the basics. This enables ruthless repeatability in your team. And in the future, if you need to do a similar deliverable again, get out your plan. Assign and manage the work to completion. You have your predictable approach forever. And you have consistency. You have reusable work. You speed yourself to completion. The architecture will change, but the process, the work, and the outcome, it all stays the same. Think about what a classic deliverable of a roadmap is included. What have you got? A roadmap is a series of work packages sequenced together. That series of work packages are all about gaps that need to be filled. Where do the gaps come from? the difference between the current state and the target that meets the needs of your set of stakeholders. How do you develop that? Well, let's describe the current state one way. Let's describe the target a different way. Oh, I can't figure out the gap anymore. What am I left to? A collection of work packages of things that I think are important. Which ones of them line up to the capabilities we want? Which ones of them create efficiency? Which ones of them create agility? What is the priority or anything on my work? I don't know because I didn't keep track of it consistently. I didn't have a good reference model. I didn't have a solid tool behind it. I wasn't keeping track of attributes. It all comes to working backwards. What do you need in order to deliver that roadmap? What work do you have that you've already done? As Simon and Dave say, break it down. Use reference models, repeatable approaches, and consistent repositories. Don't use random PowerPoints and Visios. You'll never keep track of them. At my latest engagement, I had to take the statement of work and use our approach of gather, analyze, and then report to break it down into the necessary components. I was able to use our repository to review it, to review for prior work that was relevant or if there was any prior work at all. The relevancy is key. Being able to see what applies, what still applies, that you don't have to redo it. I, you, after that, I learned where to gather, where I needed to gather more, and where I could analyze. After that, who goes to gather? Does an architect need to go gather? Or if I need more detail, can I send a subject matter expert to go gather it? And then just build off of his knowledge. Architecture should always be built against your stakeholder preferences. That's your goal. It's always your goal. If it's not your goal, who are you working for? Never do rework. It wastes everyone's time. And should only change direction if your stakeholder changes direction because otherwise you're just leaving bolts all over the floor. The 
result of all this consistency? Consistency of work. Dave mentioned we work in different time zones. How is it that all our work just fits together? The effort Nate and I were speaking to earlier was for an integration architecture. And we asked ourselves, what did we need? First, we knew we needed a reference model. And when we got a good one, we took it with us everywhere we went. Second, we had our seniors take on the gather step. You may assume that Padawans can do the gather step. In our practice, the seniors gather. What's more, we don't actually have architects do the gather. We have subject matter experts. We leverage their specialized expertise to listen and hear the nuances of the business, which then that feeds us the requirements for the analysis. We observe that many architects feel they need to know everything about everything, and we don't simply have time for that. We leverage subject matter experts to feed us exactly what we need to know. Third, then we analyze. The analysis is where everything comes together. The information flows start to paint a picture. The disparate systems that we were integrating start to appear not so disparate anymore, and they share a commonality that wasn't before apparent. So we brought specialist architecture resources to explore the complex pieces of the analysis. With a consistent approach and a strong repository, they step smoothly into their pieces of the work. And finally, you do trade-off. Getting the architecture d done requires a really detailed, nuanced understanding. You need excellent judgment for guiding stakeholders through the trade-off. The most experienced architects can take the core concepts and convey it to others so that it makes sense to non-architects. In the end, we knew we got the message right. So if you need an architecture-related deliverable, just break it all down. What do you need? Who do you need to do the work? First, get your reference model. Second, do your gather. Leverage prior work and check it for recency. Have your Padawans supported through the analysis process. And fourth, we bring in our seniors to carry our flag upstream to the leadership. And they get to take all the credit this time. <laughs> EA is predictable, and it gets more so with each iteration that you do with your team. So do you have a team? Do you have a collection of individuals? Are you leveraging the talent that is available in your organization? We did an architecture project for a construction company. The fundamental motivation, there are two. They operated as 51 distinct organizations across North America. That's the way construction companies often are. There was the commercial group for this city, the commercial group for that city, the, me the mechanical group for this city, the mechanical group for that city. Average project size that they did was $50 million. What did they want? Bigger projects. What does that require? An ability to work together seamlessly. Because what they discovered when they decided, well, we've got all these pieces, we'll bid on a big project, we'll bring everybody together, is they treated each other like subcontractors. And if you've ever worked in the construction industry, you are brutal to subcontractors. You pass risk and cost to them at every opportunity, and if you can stiff them, you stiff them. Oh, that's right, we're all sharing a balance sheet. How well did that work? So, we're architecting this. Who do you get to gather the basic information about what a best practice process design is, what a best practice information model is? Subject matter experts. People who worked on the field. People who were out on a construction of a refinery site who understood time management with 4,000 trades workers filling out their timesheets at the end of every day by task so that we could do earned value reporting tomorrow. Those are the realities. What, what's, what do you need to bring in then to architect? A team, collection of individuals, or Superman? I find working with a team, everyone wins.
I can develop consistently. I want to stress a great deal. I've come back repeatedly to the distinction between an architect and a subject matter expert. Every time we treat enterprise architecture as a seniority stage, we've assumed subject matter expertise. It's the technique. Where do I get the analysis? How do I test the analysis? And what am I looking for? Fundamentally, what I'm looking for in an architect is understanding how the system as a whole works and how it fits together. How does that system meet the needs of our stakeholders? Subject matter experts have a great deal of expertise. And increasingly, we have a modern world where our end user community are technologically savvy. They're used to using technology. They're used to applying systems, and they've been doing it since they were in kindergarten. That's a radical change in our world. It's a radical change in the enablement of our business. I can't stress enough that if you have subject matter experts acting as architects, they can cripple you. They're very bad at listening. They're very good at telling. So we've been talking about the future. We've been talking about where we're going. We've been talking about best practice architecture. And been challenging, hopefully, some of the thinking about it. We've got a recap. Sam and Nate have some points they want to really drive home. Architecture practice is best done as a team. Your leader improves technique, experience, and judgment across your team. It's the same effort for a millennial, a new architect, or an experienced architect. It's the same effort to hire any of them and bring them into your team. However, it, there is no time saving if it's the wrong person. If you bring in the wrong person and they fail to deliver, or you have to get rid of them, that is time wasted. So why did you go for old or new if they were a waste of your time? Hire for aptitude, attitude, and transferable skills. And then hold them accountable. So we talked about today how you develop best practice EA teams. We hired millennials. We've tested it, and we know it works. You probably never considered hiring a millennial before. But today, I hope we showed you how to interview for one how to assess one, and how to develop them. And by the way, this works with any architect of any age. Millennials were simply the test, and we passed. We know how much baggage we carry in the room when we walk into the interview or, or the performance review. If Dave could develop me, you can do it with anyone. Don't hire the, for the wrong team member, though. Hire for that attitude, that aptitude, and those transferable skills, that's the right team member. And Italian food. And Italian food. <laughs> We've been trying to talk about value to you, value to your organization, value to your team. Architecture is all about creating value. Every one of our organizations that we work with are successful. What they're looking for is to be better. The practitioners individually about being better and there's things to take away. Is your technique repeatable? Is your approach repeatable? Can you gather information effectively as an architect? Do you take on board that learning, the communication, the learning, the thinking skills? Think about your architecture team or the team that you work with or the team that consumes architecture. What are the pieces that need to be put in place? Nathan was talking about gather, analyze, report. It's our quick shorthand. Are we gathering things? Are we analyzing things? And are we reporting things? Who has to show up for the different stages? And that analyze piece is interesting because chunks of it I can pass off to people with limited experience. Pa chunks of it I can't. And I need it all to be consistent so that we're in a position to end-to-end -end analyze it. 
and end to end take the, vow, take the pieces that we did and don't do rework. Rework is brutally expensive. When you get a good architecture, your organization can dramatically improve. I mentioned the construction company. One of their single largest customers, as we were working through this transformation, told us, well, we really like your company. We think you're awesome. You guys do great construction. We wish that the unification between you was not the same business card. We deliberately cut the scope of work to you to be sub $40 million projects because that's anything bigger than that and you guys can't coordinate yourselves. What we were essentially hunting is larger projects have more margin. Six months after we started the transformation to grow that organization, that customer awarded them a $1.34 billion construction project to replumb a nuclear reactor based on their ability to work together effectively. That's changing an organization for the better and moving ourselves forward. So you can go back to your old ways and watch the film or start taking forward some good ideas. It's a lot of fun working with millennials. They challenge you. I'd like to thank Ken Street and Celeste for their uh, cameo appearances in our videos. <laughs> and we've got a window here for questions. So one of the important things as a leader of a team, Silver Fox, got some experience. I want easy questions without an obvious answer. And I'd like you to direct all the really hard questions to Sam and Nate. Have a seat. Thank you. Lots of questions. I get to, I get to choose who to direct them at. No, thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Um, you could tell from the... Uh, the, you had the total uh, um, total attention of the audience. Um, very quiet. It was it was wonderfully done and uh, quite thought provoking. Thank you very much. Um, okay, first question that came in was uh, very quickly coming in. You spoke of the right attitude and aptitude for the hires of the millennials. Can you say a bit more about what you look for in? in the pairing with an apprentice. So the attitude, the aptitude for the more senior person in that pairing. Oh, the essential piece is there's, there's two good um, academic works that are worth having a look at. Um, both by Lincani, the five dysfunctions of a team and teamwork. And what he's hunting for in teamwork um, in particular is the attributes around Trust, being open to being able to be vulnerable in terms of communication, um, personal style. So Sam has joked about the um, Italian food. For the last three years, uh, which is approximately a thousand nights, I think Sam and I have had dinner together about 450 times. At least. So some of that is, are we work compatible and are we um, able to to team together, but a lot of it is around: Are you in a position to teach and learn? Both. Both. Yeah. yeah. So um, Nathan and Sam, uh, what do you wish you'd known when Dave hired you? What I wish I knew three <laughs> years ago. <laughs> was that what I was being asked to do weren't just tasks. When I started, it was literally take the application, break it apart, here's the information flow, map that out, now tie those together to the business and see how they connect to the stakeholders. For me, it was one, two, three, now it's connected, I'm done. I never saw the bigger picture. I should have asked how what I'm doing is affecting what else is happening in the contracts? 
seeing the bigger picture earlier would have helped a lot. For me, if I could talk to myself three years ago, it would be don't get discouraged about how much effort you put into a piece of work that you're just going to throw away. Iteration is key. Uh, and sometimes it's the work you do that you're going to throw away is just to set, set the stage for other people to build upon. And it looks completely different at the end. OK, thank you. Next one. Um, Ken, Ken Street looked, uh, I'll add the word uncharacteristically, the question doesn't say that. Ken looked <laughs> frustrated in the performance review. How does a senior architect know when it's time to let go of a new architect? Oh, that's easy. I fire lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we were talking about there is development. So we do quarterly reviews. That's why Nate was able to talk about uh, quarterly review. And at the beginning of every review, we talk about what abilities that you're going to be working on. And we line them directly up to the work that we have and the work that we have in our pipeline. So I'm going to pick on Sam here. Uh, one of the things that she's been working at is the ability to lead a team and coordinate a team. If Sam doesn't show a progression of walking through that ability to lead, I'm now wasting my time. And the moment I start wasting my time on developing somebody who, aren't, who are not in, able to go forward, that's when it's time. Hope that answered it. It sounded sufficiently ruthless. <laughs> oh, yeah, the writing's on the wall at that point. OK. Um, what can I expect a millennial, when can I expect a, minute, a millennial to actually start doing real architecture as opposed to just supporting a senior? So when were you guys expected to start delivering useful, unique work? I would say right away. <laughs> um, the first thing you had me do was break apart our meta model and really specify it, get all the components relationships. And that really staged my fundamental learning. It's something as high up as a meta model and then seeing how it trickles down to the architectures. Uh, my question is, did they mean useful work as in work that's able to be presented to someone or work that they can say, go off and do this, you don't need me to oversight? I suspect it's the latter, but it's, it's not my question, but I suspect it's more you know, when you get when you expect it to be let loose? Uh, for me, that was definitely the second project. Our second project, I was given basically free run over, over our model, where we needed to gather how it was being put in and where they needed more. That was my second project. So, so they, they talked about building an integration model for a government agency here in California. And on that, Sam and Nathan did about 95% of the architecture. The remaining 5% was a set of uh, complex integrations between up to 400 agencies. And for that, we, we had a, a different architect do that because we just wanted to make sure that area had a high probability of having nuance that was unfair and unreasonable. So a big piece of that, as Sam said in the presentation, is not being set up. If you understand the work that you're asking somebody to do, you're in a position to have them do work that's within their capability set. Now, the other flip side is that I constantly ask them to do things that they can't do. And that's OK, because I'm not going to be the one who decides what their abilities are. They're going to demonstrate it. So I'll find safe environments for them to try things so that they can extend their skill set. Well, and like you said, you, you've stressed the, the repeatability and the use of reference models and architectures. And so you might be in at the deep end, but you've got the life belts there to, to help save, um, keep you above water. OK. Um, you seem, this is, sounds like this is for you, Dave, but uh, there may be something that Nathan and Sam can add. Uh, you seem to suggest that like a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, some IT or architecture experience could actually be a disadvantage. Is it easier to start with a clean slate as far as subject matter expertise is concerned? 
We have not hired anyone into my practice with an IT background in the last four years. And that was a deliberate choice. What I have found repeatedly is that people with an IT background carry IT baggage. And I was talking this morning at breakfast about the obsolescence of a CIO role and the obsolescence of classic IT thinking where um, more and more our IT need is being driven by our business and our business understands what they're trying to accomplish and the plumbing. I'm not interested, as a rule, in trying to solve for IT problems. I'm interested in using that example from the construction company. We built a very, very complex, from an IT perspective, um, integration between their scheduling tool and their time and labor tracking tool that the IT group argued with constantly and that was done to solve a business problem. The other aspect of what we did is the selection of the project control software was beta software. And the IT team completely said, oh, we can't do beta software. My target, our target as the architecture team was today plus six years. That was our target for reaching the company we wanted to be. The software implementation was today plus two years. My IT team were not in touch with where we wanted to get to. They weren't in touch with the scope of the transformation that was required. But flip side is that subject matter expert thing that we've been stressing, a lot of that is what do we need to do so that we actually serve the IT organization better? so that we have sustained agility, so that we have sustained security, and architecting for that up front. So a related question, uh, how would things be different if one of the people you were considering for, to, to hire uh, had an MBA uh, and an and a, uh, internship under their belts? Um, the last person I hired has an MBA. Um, and did an internship at um, Uber in South Africa in Johannesburg. So the whole approach of internship is in, uh, internship and apprenticeship is working closely with us so that we can transfer technique and experience seamlessly back and forth. Um, I don't hold having an MBA against somebody. Okay. Question initially for um, for, for uh, Sam and Nathan, um, and then Dave, I'm sure you have something to say about it. What is your view on the role of young architects in organizations like the Open Group? Um, just before we got up on stage, we were talking to many people who worked at the Open Group and that there wasn't enough involvement from young people. So I hope this was our attempt to a call to action for senior architects who do attend the open group to bring on younger people, younger architects, so that they can start attending and we can see a change in that. Yeah. For me, the open group is a great place to meet people and meet new minds. There's only so much you can learn when you have a sieve in his head. If you go for other people, you can learn all sorts of things. You can learn from the information security. You can learn from, oh, I've mainly been trying to tap into the knowledge from the information security teams. I find it a little fascinating, the way they talk about it. But you meet great people, and you learn a lot of new perspectives. So. I'm constantly looking for education and learning opportunities. We have a practice that delivers work often at a strategic or a portfolio level. And that isn't the sum total of all architecture. So we are routinely engaging our architects on uh, our staff in initiatives at the Open Group, largely as a learning exercise. I got Mats in the background, and I remember the uh, first time I worked with Mats, um, I think it was in Barcelona in 2004. I think I learned more in that weekend in Barcelona 
about service-oriented architecture than I have learned at any other point in time. That's an opportunity that is here that we don't have elsewhere. And we actively engage our people in, in the Open Group for, for those experiences. Okay, thank you. Uh, two very, well, almost identical questions. How do we retain the new talent uh, that we've trained over the last few years? Because if we believe what we read, millennials don't like to stay in one place, they want to move around. Uh, with the very closely related, what's the secret to retaining a millennial? Um, so I, I feel like that's a very common perception about millennials is that we, we want to move around a lot. And they're, from my personal perspective, I'm not chasing a bigger paycheck because I was offered yes. one. <laughs> <laughs> I was offered one, but then my growth as an architect would, apparent, would be stopped because I stayed with Dave because he's a global thought leader in the practice. And that's what I, is valuable to me is being able to grow rapidly and be able to become a, a good architect on these client sites and be billable and deliver good architecture. And um, the open group is just a great place to expand outside of someone's head, like Dave's, who is a global thought leader, but hear different perspectives. It's difficult. <laughs> um, and there's there's tremendous opportunity. It's it it's uh, the, I got into the architecture forum because we do architecture. But there's just so many domains, security, da big data. There's huge opportunities here. So how do we retain you, Nate? <laughs> For me, I'm sure you've heard either you saying it to someone my age, or someone you know saying it is. You're still young. There's still so much ahead of you. Don't let yourself get locked down into something. You can go try new things. I've said that. If you've heard that, then millennials flitting about is because they believe that they've stopped developing where they are. <laughs> through the open group, through Dave, through traveling around, all the people I've met, I've never seen a stop or wanted to stop my development. The open group is a good way for me to keep doing that. Make them believe that you're in an they are an investment to you, and they will stay with you. What we've developed is a very deliberate approach of value in a set and, and moving forward. Um, I don't think millennials are any different than any other generation. If we treat them as disposable parts, if we treat any of our workers as disposable parts, they'll act like disposable parts. They'll look for the Next thing, if you're providing a cohesive team, if you're providing um, interesting work, if you're providing continuous development, and apparently no need for more pay raises, <laughs> well. <laughs> you have retention. OK. Um, how do you deal with customers who have issues with inexperienced architects um, that you have on the team? I, I mean, no. From it, any of you, from your experience, as, as the less experienced architects, or, or, uh, or from Dave's point of view? I don't have much experience in that. I'm usually off, the off-site resource, so they just see my name right. and what I provide. <laughs> right. So, It's actually interesting, because we find most clients are actually really excited to have us on, and that Dave's effort to develop us is also an investment for the client that will become better architects for them in the future. So typically, they're really excited, and they like the idea. We run into it most often um, through supply chain and procurement, where they'll have, you got to be this tall and this old in order to um, be on this RFP. Uh, the second aspect of how we deal with it is, a big approach of it is the team. It's, we're going to approach this with the right skills. It, it, in all honesty, it is a challenge with about a third of our clients on day one, showing up with some of the people, um, delivering the work. Uh, the other aspect that we use is we talk a lot about development. And at least 50% of our work is developing in-house EA teams, helping them be better. And what we talk about is using exactly the same approach to accelerate their team's development 
as we use to develop our team's development. So uh, Nathan and Sam, how do you deal with the situation where it, uh, you find that your seniors have left bolts on the floor? We mark them. <laughs> <laughs> and we look at that bolt. Put Quality it in review is as much for us as it is for them. If they're going through our work, we go through what they did, A, to see if we can follow it, to see if we're in a position to be either asked to shadow the next time that needs to be done, or if we can just take that over. So if there's a bolt on the floor that someone leaves behind, we do get to tease them a little bit about it. But <laughs> I can imagine. We also want to know how together. the bolt got there. And then we can find our gaps. It's just tracing your steps. So. Right. The most common bolts are traceability. We'll have an architecture that says, well, we have to do this. Why? Cuz? What's the reason for the cuz? Well, it's what you should do. Cuz? Does it have anything to do with this problem? And one of the things I've observed is our new architects are far better at hearing what our clients want than our most senior architects. Right. So do you think it's possible for a subject matter expert to become an architect? Oh, I'm getting this one. Yeah, this, that one you, sounded though. hard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, it is entirely possible for a subject matter expert to be an architect, but it requires them to actually become an architect. Um, a subject matter expert has deep knowledge about how one thing or a set of things are done optimally for that problem space. That problem space may not be the defining problem space. Um, so you need to then address what is it that we're trying to solve for? What is it, that's a phrase we use a great deal, what am I solving for? What set of concerns am I solving for? And can I solve for a set of competing concerns? OK, uh, final question, I think. Um, this session was a great start. How do you suggest we improve the visibility to other new architects? How do we get the message out? I think the call to action comes to you guys, senior leaders. Hire new architects. Bring them up here. Force them to talk like Dave does. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, I, I, I think the essential piece is um, start by hiring them. Recognize that when you are hiring a new position or new role into your organization, in your perfect world, you want somebody who's got all of the skills, all of the experience to just slam dunk and fit into your team. But what you're going to run into, the, the video with the, the mass retirement, a lot of organizations are facing a silver tsunami. They're, they're looking at the retirement of older people. And what's hurting them is knowledge walking out the door. And the knowledge walks out the door because there is no useful repository of knowledge. So one of the aspects with the, the complete set that works together is when you're using a consistent approach and a consistent methodology and a consistent repository is that you're able to interleave knowledge. You're able to capture nuance and expertise at the same time as being able to bring people on board. And as Nathan says, well, I can shadow you once, and next time, can I be involved? And can I continue that development so that we can extend the work and extend that knowledge? OK. That's it for the questions. Sam, Dave, Nathan, thank you very much for this. And uh, let's uh, see how we, we can help get the, uh, get the word out as well. So uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.